first of two of the first year program lecture series. As you can see, we've been doing this for several years. It took a small hiatus, but it's back. We've had speakers from all sorts of fields in education, journalism, activism, and even some of our own distinguished professors. Tonight, we're going to have a professor come out and talk to you guys from Tennessee State uh, University. Um, but first, we need to make sure to thank all of our sponsors, especially Dow, for their involvement in our stock room. They were the ones that helped to renovate that several years ago. So make sure you always stop by and say hi to those people working in there. We'd also like to thank Cengage for their contributions for paying for our many expenses. Tonight, we have Dr. Daniel Ferreira coming to us from Kennesaw State University. He received his Bachelor's of Science in Environmental and Resources Sciences from the University of California at Davis in 2001. He then moved on to graduate school at the University of Connecticut, and he received his MS in Geological Sciences in 2008, and then continued on with his PhD in Soil Sciences with a specialization in soil chemistry in 2012. <laughs> he has had many distinguished and uh, prestigious awards for his work in advancing in the field of soil sciences, as well as innovations in environmental protection and recovery. You may have seen him on the Weather Channel. He was on an episode of the Top 10 Doomsday Disasters back in June, where he discussed the environmental impacts of methane on climate change and how it has our impending so, let's all give him a very big Aggie welcome to Dr. Dan Ferreira. A&M this year, and I'm going to talk to you guys about um, my application of geochemistry and how I use it to try and solve some of the problems that the people in Japan uh, are facing from the fallout after the Fukushima nu uh, Daiichi nuclear power plant disaster. So I'm going to start off by talking really briefly about what geochemistry is. Uh, and then I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about my research. Uh, we're going to have a little bit of basic science. I'm going to try not to get too deep into the weeds. Um, but I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about the basic science behind what I do. Um, and then I'm going to talk to you guys about some trips that I took to Japan. Uh, and what I saw in Iatate Village, which is a small farming village about 30 kilometers away from the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. Uh, and then finally, I'm going to wrap up by coming back to the theme of geochemistry uh, and talking about how geochemistry at large impacts our interaction <coughs> with the environment. So, um, I realized as I started to prepare for this talk, uh, I didn't really know what geochemistry was. So I did what every good professor does, I looked it up on Google. And Google uh, told me that geochemistry is the study of the chemical composition of the Earth and its rocks and minerals. Um, now, that's a really, really broad category. So there's a lot of different stuff that falls under this umbrella of geochemistry. So one way that we apply geochemistry is understanding uh, our soils, how our soils supply nutrients to plants and help them grow. Um, we can use technology to measure the nutrient content of the soil and make sure that we're giving the plants what they need when they need it. Mineralogy is a big part of geochemistry, so understanding the minerals that are found in our soils, in our rocks, how are these things built, what kind of
kind of structures do they have? Um, how do the structural components of these minerals impact how they behave? Uh, environmental quality, so things like stream quality monitoring, making sure that your drinking water is safe to drink and that the chemicals that are present in the drinking water uh, are, are not harmful. These are all different kinds of applications of geochemistry that we're using right now in the real world to make our lives better. So, um, before I can talk to you guys about the research that I'm doing in Fukushima, I have to uh, go over a little bit of basic science um, about the clay minerals that I work with and how they behave. So, the class of minerals that I work with are called two to one clay minerals. And basically, what that means is they have uh, two tetrahedral sheets composed of silicon and oxygen with one octahedral sheet composed of aluminum and oxygen. And we have repeating layers of the clay made up of these three sheets in sequence. Um, so the uh, tetrahedral layers are shaped like uh, trapezoids. So the um, tetrahedra with the silicon and the oxygen form uh, pyramids. Right? If you stack these things and connect them together like Legos, you wind up with this kind of trapezoid shape. The octahedral layers that are composed of oxygen uh, with aluminum instead form octahedra. So these uh, become <coughs> rectangular when you stack them together, and so that's why we have these kind of rectangular octahedral layers. Now, what happens in these clays, and the reason why these clays are so chemically reactive, is we have this process called isomorphous substitution. And basically what happens with isomorphous substitution is you're building this clay mineral, and you're expecting there to be an aluminum in the aluminum layer. But sometimes, by mistake, something else will sneak in and take the place of that aluminum atom. If you get something with a smaller charge, like a magnesium that's plus two, instead of the plus three aluminum that the crystal is expecting, this creates a charge imbalance, okay? So we're trying to balance out the negative charge of these oxygens, but the magnesium only has two plus positive charge, and it can't completely balance out the negative charge from the oxygens, so we wind up with this charge imbalance in the mineral. We have this excess negative charge that hasn't been balanced. And the way that the mineral deals with this is through the presence of cations in the interlayer of the mineral. So you remember I told you that we had uh, these two to one layers, kind of one after the other, but there's a space in between. And the space in between those layers is called the interlayer. We get cations from solution, so things like hydrogen or sodium or potassium or magnesium or calcium, whatever happens to be present in the soil, and they will move into the interlayer and they'll attach to the surface of the mineral to try and balance out this negative charge imbalance. So um, how these cations move between the solution and the surface of the mineral is primarily what I look at in my research. So we know that the, the interlayer, the space in between these layers, can change size, okay? Uh, mostly depending on water content. So if there's a lot of water, the clay mineral expands, the interlayer gets really large, and the clays get bigger. If these clays dry out, the water leaves the interlayer because it's evaporating, and that interlayer collapses and the clays shrink. And uh, I know you guys have a lot of clay in your soil here in Texas, like we have down in Georgia. And I'm sure that you guys have all seen um, this happen, right? When you have a really, really long dry spell and the soil starts to crack. You see these big cracks developing in the soil. And if this is your house, you're in trouble. Because now your foundation is going to start to crack as the soil swells and shrinks underneath it. 
Um, so this is basically a function of the interlayer of the clay kind of getting bigger and smaller and bigger and smaller. Now, the size of that interlayer can impact the ability of cations to move in and out. So as you can imagine, when the interlayer is really large, it's easy for those sodiums or potassiums or calciums or whatever to make their way into the interlayer and interact with the surface of the minerals. But when that clay interlayer shrinks and gets really small, it gets much harder for those ions to move in and out of the interlayer of the clay. So these ions that balance out the negative charge from the isomorphous substitution, they don't just stay put. Uh, if we have some negative charge imbalance in this mineral down here, and we have these two nice positively charged sodium atoms that walked into the interlayer, they adsorbed to the surface of the clay mineral to balance out that negative charge. They don't get to stay there forever. They get to hang out on that negatively charged site only until somebody else comes along and kicks them out. So along comes calcium, and calcium is plus two. And so because the calcium has a stronger positive charge, it can form a stronger bond with those negative sites than the sodium can. And what happens? The stronger ion comes in, it kicks the sodiums off of those uh, adsorption sites, and now the sodiums go back into the aqueous phase and they go back into the water. And the calcium kind of took its place. And we call this process ion exchange, right? So we had one ion that exchanged another one out. So when you have a pollutant in your soil, say you have a soil that's saturated with something nasty like arsenic or lead or mercury, and you want to get that stuff out, the general way that you clean that soil is through ion exchange. You're gonna get some benign cation, something that's good for the soil, like ammonium, and you're gonna flood the soil with that benign cation and kick all of that lead or mercury or arsenic out of the soil. And now instead you replace those harmful things with helpful things like ammonium or calcium or magnesium or something that the soil can actually use plants will actually enjoy. Now the problem um, that they're struggling with in Fukushima <laughs> is that cesium doesn't quite play by these same rules. What happens when cesium adsorbs um, on a two-to-one clay mineral like vermiculite, which is very common in that part of Japan, is the cesium atom gets into those adsorption sites and it pulls on those two layers of the clay and it slams them shut. So as the oxygen atoms at the edge of the clay slam shut around the adsorbed cesium atoms, the cesium atoms become trapped and now they can't get back out. And we call this non-exchangeable. So I can add all the ammonium, I can add all the calcium I want, it doesn't matter. Because those ammonium uh, molecules and those calcium ions, they can't get into the interlayer to knock the cesium out of the soil. So this becomes a really serious problem. Um, one of the things that I did last year was I took some uh, vermiculite, I exposed it to cesium, I took another um, set of vermiculite and I exposed it just to water, and I did an x-ray diffraction study to try and get some concrete numbers. Just how closed is this inner layer? How tightly is the cesium snapping this thing shut? And what we found out is that the, the vermiculite that was just washed with water had a despacing of 13.1 angstroms. Uh, the okay. Exposed to 
water was 13.1 angstroms. The vermiculite uh, layer itself is about 10 angstroms. So what this tells us is that the inner layer is about three angstroms wide. We took that same vermiculite, we exposed it to cesium, and what we found is that that interlayer dimension shrunk from about three angstroms to one angstrom. So the clay collapsed by two thirds, which is massive. Um, and what makes this especially problematic is that cesium has an ionic di diameter of 3.34 angstroms. So there's no way that an atom with a diameter of three angstroms is going to make it out of a one angstrom inner layer. So essentially what's happening is the clay is collapsing around that cesium like a bear trap and it's trapping that cesium inside and you cannot get it out. Um, so where this hits the real world is in Fukushima, Japan. Uh, in 2011, the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant suffered a meltdown due to the tsunami. As part of this meltdown, there were a series of radionuclides that were ejected up into the atmosphere. And these um, radionuclides, especially uh, radiocesium, which is cesium-137 primarily, they were deposited across a large swath of Japan. So you can see from this map that the radiocesium traveled really, really far. But the brown areas and the blue areas, the concentrations are relatively low. They're below the regulatory limits. So these areas were spared significant damage. Where it really got bad was in this small area here where you see these yellows and reds. Uh, those are the really, really high concentrations of radiocesium that presented uh, a really serious danger to the people who live in this region. Um, right here, smack dab in the middle of that little tongue of red, is Iatate Village, which is a small farming community um, in the mountains in Fukushima Prefecture. So uh, here's Hiatate Village. Um, it is about 30 kilometers from the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. What happened is when those radionuclides got injected up into the atmosphere, the prevailing winds blew those brake boards in Hiatate Village and deposited them in the soil. So in 2016, um, I went to Japan for the first time. Uh, one of my collaborators, uh, at Meiji University, just outside Tokyo, took me to Iatate Village to meet with the people there and speak with the people who have been affected, see some of the research that's going on there. When we got off the train in Fukushima City, my colleague handed me this portable dosimeter and he said, we've been here a hundred times, we don't pay attention to the radiation anymore, we already know where the radiation is and how high it is, but we thought you might be interested in knowing what the radiation levels are. I said, yeah, that's, you know, that's fair. So he hands me this device, and on the device it says 0 0.18. And I don't know what that means. So I asked the guy, what number on this thing do I start to get nervous? So he told me, if you see this get up to uh, 10 microsieverts per hour, you're in trouble. Turn around, run the other way. Um, in Fukushima City, which is the big population center in this area, the radiation levels 0.18 microsieverts per hour, not terrible. Um, areas where the radiation was above was 0.25 microsieverts or above were evacuated. Okay, so below that level, you're allowed to live there. Now, as we, we get in the rental car and we start driving towards the Atate, and I'm staring at this thing, uh, you know, waiting for 10 to pop up and, and, and kill me, um, and I'm watching the numbers creep up, and about maybe five minutes outside of the Atate village, we cross that threshold where we hit 0.25. And this is the, the point where 
nobody's allowed to live past this, this point. Um, the first stop um, was this farmer's house. So this house belonged to a farmer who lived in Iatate village. And during the evacuation, he allowed the researchers who were doing research in this area to use his house as a field office. So the researchers could keep their supplies there, have meetings, uh, you know, coordinate their, their research. And so we stopped here to kind of get our itinerary, figure out what was going on, uh, and eat lunch. So inside, this is kind of blurry, hard to see. Inside the farmer's house, radiation levels are up to 0.32 microsieverts per hour. So above the, the limit that you can't live there, but not quite scary yet. Not, I'm still not quite scared at this point. Um, after lunch, we got in a van and we drove to a uh, remote uh, farm up in the mountains closer to the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant in that direction. And on the way, uh, at every possible turn, we see these piles of these black bags. So the government's response to the soil contamination in this region, they sent in bulldozers, they scraped off the radioactive topsoil, and they put it in bags. They pile the bags up until they're maybe 20 or 30 feet high, and then they leave them there. And they're still there, because the government has no idea what to do with this radioactive soil. So in the meantime, this is the solution. Put it in bags, pile the bags up, and try and forget that it's there. Uh, and you can see, I mean, I'm, I'm only showing you a few pictures, but I took probably 40 or 50 pictures of piles just like this. So eventually when the pile gets to a certain size, they cover the pile with a tarp to keep off the rain and the sun so that the plastic doesn't uh, degrade. And that's it. These things are still there. So, as you can imagine, the people who live in this area, this is a really, really tough reminder for them. Every day they have to drive past these huge piles of radioactive soil. And the worst part is this is prime farmland. And nobody can farm here anymore because they've taken that land to use it to store this radioactive topsoil. So we arrived at uh, this house up in the mountains, up closer to uh, where the mountain pass is that leads to the nuclear power plant. And uh, this is another farmer that collaborates with my research colleagues uh, in Japan. And uh, these are his farm fields. Anybody who's ever seen a farm field knows this is not what a farm field should look like. What color should that soil be? Black, brown, right? Not yellow. The reason why the soil looks like this is that after the government came through and they plowed off the topsoil, the radioactive topsoil, uh, they replaced it with sand. So they brought in heavy machinery, they dug up the mountains, they ground that rock into sand, and then put it on top of the farmer's fields and said, here you go, good luck. Um, imagine trying to grow any kind of a crop in this soil. Uh, it's really, really tough. And what makes it even better is even up here, way up in the mountains in this, at this remote farm, you still cannot escape the bags of radioactive soil off in the distance. So here at this farmer's house, uh, we're getting closer to the power plant. Radiation levels are getting higher. Um, this is uh, at the entrance to the farmer's fields. Radiation levels hit 1.42 microsieverts per hour. And now I'm starting to get a little nervous. Um, but it's not 10, so I'm OK. The interesting thing about the government's response to, one of the interesting things about the government's response to this crisis, 
Uh, they only removed the radioactive topsoil within 20 meters of people's homes. They figured farther out than that, you don't need to walk that far. You don't need to go that far. Um, and so I went into the backyard. There's woods behind the farmer's house. And I'm holding the dosimeter, and I'm walking, and I'm watching the numbers on this thing slowly get higher and higher, little by little. And then all of a sudden, it jumps. 2.24. I crossed that 20-meter threshold. Um, and the radiation levels just went way, way up. And you could very clearly see um, where that line was. Now, the farmers who live in Iatate, this is a lot of problems that they have to deal with. Um, their land has been poisoned. They've been taken away from their homes. Uh, they were evacuated from Iatate for over five years, almost six years before the evacuation order was lifted. So just imagine what it would be like for you if somebody said, okay, take the clothes on your back, whatever you can carry, and disappear, you're gone for five years, six years, you don't get to come home. It's, it's brutal. But what makes it even worse is there are a lot of cultural issues in Japan that make this problem so much worse. So one of the first questions that I asked my Japanese collaborator is, why do these people want to come back? It's radioactive. Their land has been poisoned and replaced with beach sand. Why do they want to go back? And my collaborator told me, you have to understand that uh, for a lot of these people, these farms have been in their families for seven, eight, nine generations. Their families have been farming that land for 300 years. They can't just leave. That farm is part of that. It's part of their family. And so it's difficult for somebody to just come in and say, oh well, go start over somewhere else. Um, so they can't just abandon this land because the tie between the farmers and their land is so deep. And one of the things that the farmers really struggle with is that for the older farmers, they really want to come back because they've been farming this land their whole adult lives. Their fathers farm this land, their grandfathers, their great-grandfathers, and they feel that connection and they want to go back. But for their children, they don't want to go back. They may have been in high school when the evacuation order started, and now they're off to college. They don't want to be a farmer. They want to be an engineer. They want to be something else, and they don't want to go back. Uh, for the younger kids, they've made new friends. They've started new lives. They've got a new place to call home. And that farm doesn't feel like home for them anymore. And so a lot of these older farmers have to deal with the fact that this farm that may have been in their family for 300 years, they're going to be the last ones to farm that land. And it's, it's a horrible, horrible thing for them to have to deal with. One of the things that I found the most impressive when I visited Japan was the attitude of the people there. Um, they have this incredible need to help others and be kind to others. And while I was in Fukushima, I met uh, this gentleman here. This is Dr. Wakabayashi. Dr. Wakabayashi was the dean of the College of Humanities at a university in Tokyo. He retired from that university many years ago. He's 76, well he's 77 now, he was 76 when I met him last year. Uh, in his mid-70s, he decided to go back to school and get a certification to drive heavy machinery so that he could come to Fukushima and help and these just farmers blew me away. I had never met anybody like this in my life. Um, but this is the culture in Japan. So I noticed um, when I was in Fukushima, 
I wanted to take some time to appreciate the natural beauty. And I made sure while I was there to stop and take some pictures, not of radioactive soil uh, or, or you know, horrible, depressing things, to take some pictures of beautiful things. The mountains, absolutely gorgeous. The wildflowers, stunning in this area. But even when I took the time out to try and find something beautiful, <coughs> still had that damn dosimeter. I couldn't, I couldn't put it down. It was with me everywhere. This was the highest reading I, I managed to capture while I was in Fukushima. Um, 4.41, we're starting to get towards really scary at this point. Uh, and yes, I did turn around and run the other way. So this summer, um, I went back to Japan with my uh, graduate student. This is my grad student, James. This is uh, Dr. Noborio, my um, colleague at Meiji University, and his grad student, Yuki. Uh, we went back to Fukushima to collect some soil samples to do some research. So we went for, uh, my student was there for about two and a half months. I was there for a month this summer to try and actually get some research done. Um, we collected soil samples from various different areas with different radiation levels so that we could experiment, we could bring them back to Meiji University and uh, do some experiments with them. This is the uh, radiation level where we collected our first set of soil samples, three microsieverts per hour, pretty high, um, not horrendous, but pretty bad. And the reason why the radiation level is so high in this particular spot is uh, if you look really closely in the background here, you see there's a, a pass, a mountain pass. Uh, and on the other side of that pass is the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. So when the wind carrying those radionuclides came through that mountain pass, it hit this patch, this farmer's house, right here. Um, the farmer who lives in this house told us that the day after the meltdown, somebody came to measure the radiation levels at his house, and the radiation levels were 8,000 microsieverts per hour. He lived there three months before the government finally evacuated the Atate village. And I asked him, you must have been to the doctor. What did the doctor tell you? And he said, well, the doctor told me uh, the radiation will kill me. He doesn't know when, he doesn't know how. Everybody reacts to radiation differently. Uh, two people standing on this same spot, one person might get brain cancer, the other person might get thyroid cancer, or liver cancer, or lung cancer. Uh, it's different for everybody. So the doctor basically told him, um, I can pretty much guarantee that your life will be cut short because of that exposure to the radiation, but I don't know by how much. And I just cannot imagine having to live with that knowledge. So we brought the soil from the uh, farmer's yard back to the university where we sieved the soil to remove roots and rocks and things that are not soil. Um, and then we took that soil and we uh, separated out the clay fraction. So we don't want to deal with the sand or the silt or the organics. I just want the clay, the clay that's got that radiocesium in it. Um, we treated the, the, the clay with uh, a strong organic solvent, methanol. This <laughs> dissolves all the organics so that we don't have any foreign materials to interfere with the chemistry that we're going to do. We took that extracted clay and we mixed it with a solution of magnesium nitrate 
and an organic compound called sodium tetrachus 4 fluorophenyl borate. You don't have to remember that, it doesn't matter. So, um, what makes this funky organic compound so important is somebody uh, in a university in Tsukuba, which is just north of Japan, had done some research that had shown that the combination of these two things could chemically remove the cesium from the interlayer of the clay. Now you remember I told you, the interlayer slams shut and the clay gets trapped, and the, or the cesium gets trapped. You can't get the cesium out of the clay. This guy figured out a way to do it. And it has a, a large part to do with the fact that magnesium is a really, really small ion for you chemistry students out there. Magnesium plus two, really tiny. And it figures out a way to get into that interlayer and kick the cesium out. Now, that funky organic compound, the tetrachus 4 fluorophenyl borate, is waiting in solution to snatch that cesium up and precipitate with it. So this particular organic compound is, becomes insoluble in the presence of cesium. So this idea is, is brilliant in its simplicity. It's a one-two punch. The magnesium goes in and knocks the cesium out of the interlayer, and as soon as the cesium gets into solution, the organic compound is waiting there to grab that cesium and precipitate it out, and now it can no longer get back into the clay. But this researcher had managed to do this with a pure clay that he made in the lab. I wanted to see if it would work with the actual Fukushima soil. So we treated the clay, we added the two chemicals, let it mix for a couple of hours, and then we extracted the supernatant, we evaporated it, and lo and behold, we found a white powder at the bottom of our aluminum dishes, which is what the researcher had described this cesium uh, to track this fluorophenyl borate compound as a white powder. So it looks like we were successful in extracting the cesium from the clay, something that all the papers I've read say should not be possible, but it looks like we did it. Um, we don't have our final data back on this yet. This is the preliminary data that we collected while we were there. Um, we had three, we started off with four samples, but one of them got contaminated. Um, but what this showed, we took the untreated vermiculite, so this soil here that came out of the sieve, we put it into a gamma spectrometer that measures the radiation coming off of that soil. And we found levels of radiation between about 50 and 80 becquerels per kilogram. Then we took the soil, after we put it through that treatment, we put it back in the gamma spectrometer, and for two of our samples, we showed a dramatic decrease in the radiation, indicating that the radiocesium is no longer present in the clay. So obviously we can't draw any broad sweeping conclusions from two data points. Um, we are waiting to replicate this, uh, and hopefully we, our replication will be successful. Um, but it looks like we did uh, what we set out to do. So we took the actual Fukushima soil and removed the cesium. So this was one of the research projects that we worked on this summer. Uh, the other project that we worked on was related to another concern that people who live in this area have, and that's the potential for the unremediated areas to recontaminate the areas that have already been cleaned. So this is a very steep, mountainous region. This is the hill in the backyard of that first farmhouse that I showed you, the field office that the researchers use. And you can see, 
It's bare soil up to about this line, and then all of a sudden, vegetation. Anybody want to guess how far this is from the farmer's house? 20 meters. So this soil up here has not been remediated. That radioactive topsoil was not removed. What happens when it rains? <coughs> right? The rainfall is going to wash some of that soil down the hill and potentially recontaminate the area that's already been cleaned. And this is a really big concern. <coughs> so uh, this is a, a long-term project that my collaborator is doing there where he's looking at radiation levels in the foliage at different points along the hill to see how fast the, the radioactive clay is making its way down the hill slope. There are also uh, a ton of little creeks and streams that come out of the mountains that nobody has been to since the disaster. And obviously there's a concern that these could be transporting radioactive soil from up in the mountains and recontaminating the areas in the valley. So the idea that we came up with to deal with this is to use a bioindicator. So a bioindicator is when you use a plant uh, or some other organism to give you a clue about the environmental quality in a particular area. So the idea is if we can find a plant that is particularly sensitive to the radiocesium, we can plant these plants along the bottom of the hills and all you have to do is look out your window. Are the plants still alive? Okay, we're all good. The day that you wake up and you look out your window and those plants are starting to die, you know that radiocesium is making its way down the hill slope. Uh, this is a particularly uh, attractive solution to this problem because it doesn't require high-tech uh, uh, equipment like dosimeters that are expensive uh, and, and costly, and it's a large area. Okay, plants, pretty cheap. So from the government's point of view, this is a nice way to solve the problem. So uh, James and I collected soil from three different areas uh, in Fukushima, uh, a highly contaminated soil, a medium contaminated soil, and a low contaminated soil. And then we planted two different species of plants. Uh, these are May lilies and these are bracken ferns. And both of these uh, were used as bioindicators in Chernobyl after the nuclear disaster at Chernobyl. So we're trying to find out if they can serve a similar purpose in Fukushima. Okay, so come back to geochemistry. I've given you guys kind of an insight into one very specific uh, problem that I'm trying to use geochemistry to solve. But there are tons of different environmental problems that we're facing today that are directly linked to geochemistry. Climate change. Climate change has to do with the chemical composition of our atmosphere. This is geochemistry. Pollution. We burn fossil fuels. We release pollutants like lead and mercury, uh, sulfur oxides, nitrogen oxides, particulate matter. We release these things into the air. They settle into the soil. They settle into the water. They get into the food chain. How do these things move through the different parts of the environment? How do they move through the water? How do they move through the soil? How do we get them out? Geochemistry. Water quality. What's in your drinking water? How did it get there? Is it going to hurt you? Is there lead in your water? Is there methane in your water? This is all geochemistry. Non-traditional pollutants, so things like fertilizers, things like hormones, antibiotics, antidepressants getting into our water. 
How are these things interacting with the other chemicals in the water? How are they affecting the organisms that live in the water, in the soil? Again, this is all geochemistry. <coughs> but the flip side of that coin <coughs> is that we can also use geochemistry to solve a lot of these problems. We want to get a handle on climate change. We need to find new ways to generate energy. We need to find new ways to power our vehicles. We have scientists out there working with things like hydrogen fuel cells, trying to find new ways to transport us and our goods around the planet. We have scientists trying to figure out ways to make our power plants cleaner. Can we take the pollution that comes out of a coal-fired power plant and treat it? Can we use chemistry to find ways to transform those pollutants into less harmful forms? Absolutely we can. Can we find ways to purify our drinking water? Can we get the things in our drinking water that are harmful out so that we can drink that water freely without fear of getting sick? <coughs> Absolutely, we can solve that problem. Can we deal with our water quality? <coughs> Definitely. Lots of farmers now are installing uh, water quality systems like this one at the edges of their farm to make sure that they're not leaching excess fertilizer, pesticides, herbicides into the streams, into the creeks that flow into our rivers and become our drinking water. Absolutely, we can use chemistry to solve these problems. Now, these ideas that I presented with you, uh, presented to you are all things that we're working on right now today. But you freshmen out there, I have no idea what you guys are going to come up with. The sky is the limit. So I hope that you guys have enjoyed this talk. And I'm happy to take any questions. Here at Texas A&M, he's doing his PhD with Dr. Memorial right now.